out of the book of Judges. Judges is one of my favorite books. I, I know I say that a lot. This is my favorite. This is my favorite. How many of you know it's all good? Everybody say it's all good. It, it's, all, it's all good. But Judges is a, one of my favorite books because it's a unique time in the history of, of Israel. I would encourage each and every one of you in 2023, maybe you already know this, maybe you need to kind of go back and do some refreshing, but when you read the Bible, the books were not written in chronological order. What really made the Bible come alive for me, which really kind of snapped for me in my life and really drew even greater depths of interest, was when you recognize the history of Israel. When you take it all the way from the garden and you take it all the way to the the tree of life, and you take it all the way to, to the New Jerusalem, and you kind of plot that out chronologically, then it makes sense. When you're reading a prophet, even though they're out of sequence, you kind of know where that fits in, where that plots along uh, on that historical timeline. What I think is so interesting about Judges is it was an unprecedented time. God, through the patriarch Abram, the father of faith, told him that he was giving him a, a big piece of real estate, wasn't he? And that they would enjoy that, and they would enjoy that land and the benefit of that land uh, as long as they were obedient to God. And so we see that happen. We see the, the succession of patriarchs, and, and then we know here comes little baby Moses along in the, in the basket, and, and he grows up, and God speaks to him, and God uses him in this prolific way. He he speaks the law to him and, and ultimately has all of these adventures on this amazing extended camping trip. And, but eventually, because of, a, of an act of disobedience, you know the story. Moses is not allowed to, to take the people into the promised land. He can only watch from a distance. And his right-hand man by the name of Joshua has the responsibility of taking all these people into Canaan, into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and, and honey. But eventually, like all of us, hate to break it to you, spoiler alert, he dies. We all die. And so we find Israel is in the promised land, and yet this is the, the period of time historically before the kings, before Saul and David and Solomon. And so the people are kind of left without a, a leader, or so we think. And God raises up what we know now because we're students of the Bible, particularly the book of Judges. He raises up these 12 judges. Now, this is not a, a dynastic order. Matter of fact, it's kind of a hodgepodge, kind of a, a miscellaneous group. And, and, and some of you would think, man, that person, I didn't see any leadership in that person at all. But, but God uses flesh. He uses this, these people, these judges, to, to lead his people for a time. The people need leadership. How many of you know we need leadership? Amen? I said we need leadership. Amen? And, and, and so just like us, we needed, we, they needed that leadership. And, and God would raise up these, these judges. Now, what's so interesting about the book of Judges is that we see a, a cycle. We see a repetition of behavior on the people's part and on God's part that you and I can relate to individually, and yes, even corporately, and I think even nationally, is that the people without a leader, without a theocracy, without a fear of God, they begin to sin. They begin to trespass. They become lawless. And guess what? When you live in sin, that the consequences or the wages of sin is death, and therefore they end up in a very, very bad place. And they begin to sin. They do all the stuff they God warned them about. They do all that, and they find out that God indeed is a promise keeper. They're living in sin. They're living with the consequences of sin. Well, being flesh like you and I are flesh, they recognize, uh-oh, we messed up. And so what do they naturally do? They did what we do. We cry out to the Lord. Lord, guilty, I did it. You, you warned me against this, this hot burner, but I intentionally touched it anyway, and now my hand is throbbing. Help me. And sure enough, God, who is rich in mercy, who is loving and gracious, would raise up and send them one of these leaders, a, a judge. And so there would be this, this time of, uh, of relief, of, of restoration. Oh, we, we learned that. Boy, we, we learned our lesson with that one. But eventually what happens? They begin to sin again. They become spiritually lackadaisical. 
they begin to get away from the law. They get away from those things that God had spoken to, to, to Moses. And, and, and again, they're, they're eating the fruit of, of their disobedience. Well, what happens again? They cry out. God has mercy, sends a judge. There's a time of relief. And then there is that time again of, of not following God. And round and round we go. You almost need Dramamine. You get motion sick when you, when you read the book of Judges. The fifth of the 12 judges is the only female judge. And she was a great, great leader, Deborah. Deborah was a great, great leader. Matter of fact, she was uniquely qualified to, to lead Israel for, for an extended period of time. And, and what's interesting, it's not this time of, of great peace, but instead we read in Judges chapter 4 specifically that the Israelites are being harshly oppressed by the Canaanites. Those are the folks that are still living in the land who do not like the fact that they're in the land. These are people who are multi-theistic. They worship all kinds of gods. They're pagan. And we find that there's a lot of them. We also find that at that time when Deborah is judged, that they have 900 iron chariots. Now, you would say, well, iron's no big deal. I mean, iron, we just, we, anybody in awe of iron? But if you lived 3,000 plus years ago, iron was an amazing commodity, especially if you were in battle and warfare. And so Israel, in chapter 4, for 20 years is being oppressed by the Canaanite king by the name of Jabin. Everybody say Jabin. Jabin has a commander, his, his main general, his, his General Schwarzkopf. Anybody remember General Schwarzkopf from back in the day? You're dating yourself right now. And, and his name is Sisera. Everybody say Sisera. And so they are keeping the people down intimidated, and they are cruel to them, according to Judges chapter 4. And then God begins to speak to Deborah. And he says, I'm going to deliver these Canaanites into your hand. Deborah goes to a fellow by the name of Barak. Everybody say Barak. And she says, here's what needs to happen. You, Barak, are going to take 10,000 men. You are to go to Mount Tabor, which is right there by the river Kishon. And you are to go there, and I will personally lead this, this army right into your hands. Deborah has given him a vision. Deborah's given him an invitation. Deborah has given him an amazing opportunity to be known, to be encapsulated, to be a part of the, of the, of the hall of fame of faith. I'm going to bring them to you, and God is going to destroy them. And Barak responds, I'll do it, but you're going to go with me. You're going to go with me. He knew what a great leader she was. He knew, and he could sense the the favor of God on her life. He wanted her to come along. I'm, I'm, I'll, I guess I'll go, but under one condition, I want you to go with me. And Deborah responds, I'll go with you. But here's the deal, is all the glory will go to a woman. And she's not talking about herself, interestingly enough. Well, we find, because we've rest, read the rest of the story here, he, Barak gets all these, these 10,000 guys, they go there, and sure enough, they're down by the river Kishon, and, and God sends a tremendous thunderstorm. And those iron chariots that were to their benefit now are bogged down in the mud. And these soldiers, these Canaanite soldiers, are sitting ducks. And sure enough, they all get whacked. Except Sisera, the general. He goes running for his life. You can only imagine the stress of that, this tremendous battle and, and being responsible and just getting absolutely pulverized, you and your men. And he is running for his life. And he runs so far and he sees a tent in the distance. It's Heber's tent. And Heber has a, a wife, a housewife, J.L. Everybody say J.L. J.L. sees him coming and says, come, come in, come in. I'm going to show you some of our, our signature Israel hospitality. Come on in. Come on in. Obviously, you're stressed, you're exhausted, you're thirsty, you're tired, you're hungry. Come on in, come on in, come on in. And he is glad to get away. He goes on in. She gives him some milk. Have a, you must be exhausted. Lay down. He 
lays down. She puts a cover over him. Before you know it, he is snoring. JL grabs a tent peg, <laughs> puts it on his temple, and kills him. Probably should have done a disclaimer with that little story, in case there's little ones watching or, or watching online. A little, little bloody, a little, little graphic, one of those moments that it's, that, that's, that's more than just a victory story. That's, that's like really gross. And guess what? In the next chapter, Judges chapter 5, the song of Deborah, an entire chapter, the song of Deborah, it was Casey Kasem's number one top 40 song during the reign of Deborah. And guess what? JL, not Barack, but JL, this little housewife in this little tent out in the middle of nowhere, gets four verses devoted to her. Now, to make it even, you also know that Barak is mentioned in the Hall of Fame of Faith, found in, in Hebrews chapter 11, but he doesn't get the play he should have. He doesn't get the play or the glory assigned to him and memorialized to him that he could have. It's an interesting story. You kind of have to go through the word to, to get some of these stories, to excavate some of these, of these things. And so the big question, as 2024 has already come, and we're well into it, is are you going to be a JL or a Barack? When a vision comes, with an opportunity knocks, when you have the assurance that God is already with you, are you going to side with fear or are you going to side with faith? Are you going to side with no or are you going to side with yes? Which one? You have a choice. Here's what I know about you today. And there's some of you I don't know. I look forward to, to meeting. Okay? Is that... <laughs> is that opportunity knocks loudly every single day. I know that about you. If you're a follower of Jesus, living in the world, working in the world, living in the world, playing in the world, enjoying the community, every single day, not by coincidence, but by the providence of the Almighty, the Holy Spirit is intersecting your path and giving you opportunities every single day. Opportunity is, and the question du jour is, who's going to answer the door in 2024? Hey, that rhymed. Who's going to answer, answer the door? Here's what I know, is that many to, to most, many to most Christians default to no. When opportunity knocks. You ever thought of that? Many to most Christians default to no. In other words, they may give you the religious response, let me pray about it. And friend, there is times where you certainly need to pray. But not every opportunity is for you to put a Heisman Trophy stiff arm up and say, you got to pray. If it's in the Bible and God calls you to do it, you're to say yes to that. Only if it violates scripture or your conscience should you not do it. But reality tells us is that many to most Christians, and I pray not you, default automatically to opportunities with a no. Why? Why? I think there's a few reasons why. First of all, there's the, the fear of the unknown. I've never done this before. I, I've never... I've, I've never I've never done that. I have no practical experience doing this. I, I believe God is knocking on the door of my heart. I'm supposed to do something here. I'm supposed to help this person. I'm supposed to begin this ministry. I'm supposed to come alongside this ministry. But I, I, I've never, I have no experience. I believe another reason we say no is fear of failure. You know what? Not only do I have no experience, but man, I don't want to get egg on my face. You know? 
I, I, uh, I, I don't want to look like, I, I just don't like that. I don't, anybody like being embarrassed publicly? It, very few. How many real people came to church today? Yeah, none of you like being, I, I don't like it either. I don't like it either. Fear of failure. How about this one? Fear of standing out. You know what? I don't want to be a salmon swimming against the stream. <laughs> I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be stigmatized as a goody two-shoes. I, I, yes, that sounds like a cool opportunity. I go out to the Welcome Center here in the lobby, and uh, there's, a, there's the sign up. Uh, there's nobody else on it. I kind of feel like I'm supposed to do something, but I, I don't want just, just my name on this thing. Man, that means I might have to lead it. I, I don't want to stand out. I'll, I'll shrink back into the congregational shrubbery. And I think there's a fourth reason. We don't talk much about this. It's fear of success. Oh, my gosh. What if God answers my prayer? Now what? I've, 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 I come from a, a line of, of people, of family members, where it's okay just to kind of be mediocre and to default to no. And, man, what if this actually works? What if that opportunity actually bears fruit? Man, now what do I do? So many of us, we already have, who by paralysis, by analysis, we just default to, to no. There's a Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu. He said this, he said that the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Anybody ever heard that or, or some variation of that? Yeah, we all have, right? Yeah, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And I would stand here on this day, January 7th, 2024, and I would say, uh, maybe. I would contend that there's a step before the step. That there's a step that needs to be taken before a physical step towards a great or honoring endeavor. That before any of those great things happened, it began with a simple word, yes. It began with a simple word or a simple internalized thought, yes. Right after this, uh, this service with you guys, um, um, we offer, uh, every couple of months, we offer a membership class, Discovering MBCC. And we, we go through who we are, where we're aiming, all that good stuff, and stuff that we ordinarily don't talk about, but... By now, if you've been coming around a while, you know that we have a, an NBCC vision. It's our motivation. It's our dream. It's our target. And it basically is that New Beginnings Christian Church is real people who desire to live exceptional lives that point others to an irresistible Savior. Part of that, some people kind of grapple with. What's this exceptional lives? Are you, are you somehow saying, man, we're, we're so much better than everybody else. We are exceptional. We are different on the, on the highest or perhaps even a, a prideful level. And when we talk about exceptional lives, and when we launched this several years ago, I, I, I spoke on it uh, with greater detail. But, but when I talk about that you and I desire to live exceptional lives, that we would be distinct. We would be distinct, we would be attractive in the sense that our attractiveness would be salt and light, it would be glorifying to God, it would be a, a representative of Christ himself. When I say that we are a, living a consecrated life, we're desiring to live a consecrated life, that, that we would leave set apart, that we would live a, a contagious life, not medically, but but that people would see the way we live. They would see the joy by which we live. They would see that, you know what, when everybody is saying lions and tigers and bears, that somehow we're smiling through it all, that there would be distinctives about our life that would be attractive and, and that we would live honorably in the world. And then again, not better than the world, not prideful in any kind of way, but we would live in a way that, that would draw attraction and, and would be inquisitive. Here's what I know. And a lot of stuff I don't know, guys. A lot of stuff I'm still trying to figure out is that exceptional lives don't happen as a result of no. It's impossible. It's impossible. 
Exceptional lives don't happen when we just automatically, as Christians, default to no. Do I see that as an opportunity? Yeah. It does, is, does that in any way violate Scripture? No. Is that in any way violating your conscience? No. Exceptional lives don't happen that way. Exceptional lives don't happen when we say no. To say no, listen, according to Jesus himself, anybody interested in what Jesus has to say? I'm kind of thinking that since you're in church today. Jesus actually says this. He says, to say no is to miss life. It's to miss life. How do I know that? Because Jesus said so. In Matthew 16, 25, Jesus said, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. See, that flies directly into the flight path of the world. The world is preaching a sermon. You have listened to it. You've heard it all of your life. You've also been desensitized to it. And some of you, sadly, have embraced it. And it's the bumper sticker, he who dies with the most toys wins. That life is about acquisition. Life is about getting all the gusto that you can. And Jesus comes along and said, "Uh uh-uh, that's not how you experience abundant life, John 10. Instead, it's as you give your life away. As you share, as you humble yourself, as you see everyone else as equals and people to be served. As you do what I do, that's when you find real life. (laughs) See, exceptional lives only happen when we say yes to Holy Spirit-ordained opportunities, not by defaulting to ultra-safe no. So that's what we're going to do. That's where we're going. I'm hoping today you are going to hook your boxcar onto ours. That's where we're going in 2024. And I'm so excited about it. I'm so excited that our theme for New Beginnings Christian Church will be say yes. That we would see individually, we would see collectively, that we would not default to no. That would be absolutely, by the end of this year, absolutely unfashionable. But instead, we would see the opportunities that are being given to us. Just like Deborah said, just go there. I, with the Lord, will give these soldiers into your hands. You just got to go. And the only way you're going to go is when you say, say yes. So why? Why do it? Why do it? Let me just share some objectives really quickly with you. First of all, and I think it's the most important, is to bring God glory. That's why you're on the planet. That's why you're on the planet. You are more, I've taught this many times in my four plus years, you are more than the, what, the goo, you know, that went to the zoo and now is you. That's not, you're not just the, the byproduct of DNA happenstance, that your life was fully known, as we talked about last week, that you, your life is, is ordained of God himself. And you're here, and we're here together to bring God glory, and not just on Sunday morning at, at 1030, <laughs> but we're to give him glory. Glory 24-7. And we give him glory when we say yes to living the lives that he wants us to live. I think there's a few other objectives. First is to discover real life. I don't want to leave the planet without experiencing what real life is about. Real life is about giving your life away. Real life can only happen, and abundant life can only happen when you say what? Say yes. And then there's a third one. And I believe that this is a great objective, and that is to contribute to the general health of the church. Healthy bodies grow. Healthy bodies grow. Churches grow when they're healthy. Your body grows when it's healthy. Some of you are saying, my body's still growing, and it should have stopped growing a long time ago. And... uh, (laughs) But healthy bodies 
are designed by God to, to grow. And what does a healthy New Beginnings Christian Church look like? Everybody united using their spiritual giftedness. That's it. We're not building rockets here. Everybody united utilizing just the way God made you. The stuff you like, the stuff you're good at. And when you bring your toys and I bring my toys and we bring these things together and we humbly recognize, I don't have all the toys, but you have toys I don't have. You and I have a great time together. And the world, according to Scripture, gets to see the living, moving, touching, breathing, caring, reaching, walking, risen Jesus. But that only happens as each one of us are not saying, no, I ain't coming with my toys. But instead, I'm going to bring who God has uniquely created me to, to come to this place, to participate and to humbly participate in all of this. So is there a plan? Yes, I'm so glad you asked me. By the end of the year, if God gives us the end of the year, you're going to gag on this slogan, say yes. Because every single quarter of the year, we're going to have a different say yes theme. Next week when you come back and you bring guests with you, I just point to do that. I know he's always there for me. We're going to break it down into different focuses. Is focus is a word? Or is it foci? I'm not sure. Anyway, Greek. The first quarter, we're going to be focusing specifically on saying yes to abiding. Abiding. January through March, we're going to be talking about abiding. What, is, what does that mean? That means knowing, connecting, and yielding to God. Each and every one of us, no matter if you're a new kid on the block, whether you know God or not, whether you've walked with God for a long, long time, by the end of March, my goal is that each and every one of us will be way better theologians. We're going to be talking about God, and that train leaves the station next week. And so I want you to know, because it's the most noble pursuit your life can be about. Second quarter, April through June, we're going to be talking about worship. Say yes to worship. And in that, what we're going to be talking about, not just the musical portion, though that's a big part of it, but we're going to be talking about recognizing and how to react to his majesty. That then will cascade into the third quarter, which is say yes to relationships, July through September. Why? Because through God recognizing him, through worship, our understanding of him, that's going to cascade into transformed unity with other people. We're going to be talking about marriage. We're going to be talking about parenting. We're going to be talking about how to be a Christian in the workplace. We're going to be talking about how all of this cascades and overflows into your relationships. And then the last quarter, we're going to focus on say yes to action, October through December. That will align really, really nicely with our faith promise emphasis that we have here and and we're going to be talking about how this gospel and our personal relationship with this majestic God who is transforming us, transforming our earthly relationships, how that is to be effective in our outreach to community, country, and world. It's very natural cascading. And again, it begins actually next week. Now, just to let you know, there's going to be some changes that go with each one of these promotions. Each one of these emphasize, emphasis uh, will, will come with uh, different stage designs. Uh, it'll come with, with different kind of promotions. Um, it's going to come with different swag. How many people are noticing the, the swag, right? I'm, I'm going to see how, how earthly you are right now. I want to give two of these away, T-shirts. Where are they at? Oh, they're right there in front of me. Who, who wants a free T-shirt? Yeah, you guys lose your mind over that. There you go, brother. It is. I'm supposed to throw it? I don't want to throw it. I don't want to throw it. I want a lady to have it. Right on. Right on. I want to. I'm, 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 Marty, Marty and Libby are super close. They just posted. They just went to the bowl game in Tampa last week. 
We're going to actually see him fight right now. You ready for that? Here we go. I'm going to throw it right between you guys, okay? And Steve London is right behind him. I think he's trying to get the, get the pick six on this. I don't know. All right, Libby's up. There we go. You got it? All right, Libby, right on. Dignity back. Uh, you can't. It's uh... in conclusion. Barack. Barack was presented with an opportunity. He was presented with a vision. He was he was presented with a a, a golden opportunity. But he he needed the assurance. He needed the assurance that that Deborah would be with him, that she would go with him. Friends, today, Jesus Christ has given each one of us a vision, and he's given us a golden opportunity, individually and corporately. And here's the beauty of it. With the assurance that he will be with us. How do I know that? Because you and I read the the Bible. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That doesn't sound like much of a, a no factored in that. But here's what makes it so amazing. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That God says, you know what? It's a big commission. Go win the world for me. Don't just win them. Baptize them. What? Don't just baptize them. Teach them. Yes. H how? How are we going to do that? There's a lot of people in the world. That's a big vision. That's global. That's galactic in scope. And Jesus assures those guys, we're doing it together. God calls us to do some difficult things, doesn't he? How's everybody doing with loving your enemy? Real people, you still with me? How are we doing with that one? But you see, he's not a cruel savior. He doesn't have any expectation of things that aren't realistic. Wouldn't that be cruel? Go do this, go do this, knowing you can't do that. But the beauty of it is that Jesus said, I'm going to do it with you. When I call you to do big things, when I call you to do difficult things, when I call you to do things that make your ulcer kind of burn a little bit more, I'm doing it with you. We're, we're going to do this together. I'm, I'm going to help you with that. I'll be with you. My, my yoke is easy. My burden is, is light. If God's for us. Who can be against us? A younger version of me, I know uh, that's impossible to believe, but a younger version of me as a, as a minister, I had a big... A big job. Coming right out of Johnson Bible College in the booming metropolis of Kimberlin Heights, Tennessee. Um, suddenly, Michelle and I were back in, um, back in Tampa. The door opens. We're working for a mega church in East Tampa. And by God's amazing trajectory, we never anticipated, before long, I've gone from a summer intern into the associate pastor, and I'm part of something that is just blowing my mind. I was in charge of pastoral care. Uh, I basically lived in hospitals, at hospital beds, funeral homes, <laughs> wherever I was needed. We had about 2,500 people on the books in the church, and, and if one of their children who wasn't a member needed somebody, you were there. So I, I was always on the road. 
And I remember when I first began, and somehow I always tie this with the parking garage over at St. Joseph's Hospital. But there were many times where a younger version of myself, I was sent to go pray with, minister to somebody I didn't know. And I have to admit, guys, it was intimidating. It was an opportunity. It was an invitation. But, uh, man, I remember. And, and I remember sitting in my car so many times. Lord, this could go really, really bad. I don't know this person. I don't even know if they have a foundation of faith. I, I don't know if my, my short visit will be a, a blessing to them or it's just going to make them feel worse. And then I found a verse. It's the verse that I would read over and over again until I got the courage to actually leave my car, go up the elevator, and very coyly go in their hospital room. 1 Peter 3.13. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? sit there in my car, scared to death, and like, Lord, I know you called me. I never thought I'd be doing this. I'm sitting in this car. You know my, my fears. But Lord, I'm here. I said yes, and I'm eager. I'm eager, Lord. And so I'm going to go up to that room right now. <laughs> I don't know who's in there or how this is going to go, but I know that I said yes, and I'm eager, and I'm willing. And the most beautiful thing is you're going to go with me. Who's going to harm you, Steve, if you're eager to do good? When you say yes, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Not, oh, I have to. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to get fired if I don't go up into this room. Oh, my gosh, they don't pay me enough to do this. But, Lord, I said yes, and I'm eager. And I'm not going up there alone. God is going to continue to give you opportunities every single day. So the question is, in 2024, and it's still early, is when opportunity, who's going to answer the door? Barack or JL? Fear or faith? No? Yes. Father, you always are knocking on the door. Father, would you give us eyes to see? Father, would you give us ears to hear? And Father, in this new year that you have graced us with, would you give us the courage? The courage that comes along with the eager. Father, this is so much more than just t-shirts and promotions. This is how you're calling us to live as your ambassadors, filled with your spirit. Father, I pray. I pray that more of us will be JLs. Bless this year, Lord, as we draw closer to you, as our worship becomes more directed, personal. Heavenly Father, be with us, Lord, in the way that that's going to overflow into our relationships with, with one another. And Father, how that eventually will, will direct us in the community, country, and world. Father, that's not going to happen no. Father, help us say yes. 
to your son's name we pray. The one who goes with us. Amen. If you have a decision to make today, why not make that? There's some of us here today, we, we don't know Jesus. You know he's a big deal, but you don't know him. You don't know him as Lord and Savior. And today, I pray would be your day of salvation. There's some of us, and we come to church, and we know some people, and we sit in our favorite places, and yet we know this, and God knows it. Maybe other peoples are a bit snowed to it, but we're drifting. Our hearts are drifting. Maybe today, again, just spitballing, is the day the Holy Spirit's knocking on the door of your heart, not to a defaulted no, but to yes, come home. Pastor Steve, if I respond to that one, everybody will know that I've been drifting. So what? Who gives a rip? Come home. You can always come home. Maybe some of you looking for a church. Maybe some of you just, I don't know. Again, sometimes I just feel like the waiter coming up with a menu. You know, here's the specials today, you know what the chef cooked up for you today. We're about to sing, and and, and maybe maybe you just don't need to sing. You need to do like my buddy Bob here, man. Just fold your hands and pray. Not every decision is a public decision. God's already been moving in this. We've been praying. However God's calling you to respond right now, forget no.